All right, this morning, as we bring our sermon series on the kingdom of God to a close, we're looking today at the Gospel of John, chapter 3. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I hope that you do, open your Bibles to John, chapter 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 21 in just a moment or two. In the 40 days between rising from the dead and returning to heaven, According to Acts chapter 1, verse 3, Jesus spent that time with his followers speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Of all the topics he could cover with his disciples in that critical season of, of this newborn Christianity, he spent that time speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And so we've seized upon that idea and we've spent these Sundays between Resurrection Day, March 31st, and Ascension Day, May 9th, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. I've called this uh, series of sermons, The King and His Kingdom. The kingdom of God now is the rule and reign of God in believers' hearts. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, same thing. The rule and reign of God in believers' hearts. This, this is why Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. God's kingdom is not an earthly kingdom built and maintained by worldly powers. It's spiritual, not physical. It's invisible, but real nonetheless. That's the kingdom now. But the day's coming when the kingdom of God will be fully realized when our Lord Jesus returns, not as the suffering servant, as in his first coming, but as the conquering king. And when his throne is firmly established on earth, righteousness and justice, loving kindness and truth will prevail and pervade in every aspect of life. Now we experience the kingdom of God in our hearts, but then the whole world will be his kingdom. Now we eagerly await that glorious day, but then our faith will be made sight as we see our king's face and we bow at his feet. But there's the matter of who will see or experience the kingdom of God now or then. And this is what we're talking about today. What Jesus meant when he told the religious teacher Nicodemus you must be born again. You must be born again. Beginning in verse one. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does not Excuse me, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be made, uh, may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Twice in that exchange, Jesus spoke of the necessity of being born again. Verses 3 and seven. But in verse three, and I think you'll see why I'm highlighting this particular verse, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When someone says, I'm a nurse, or an airline pilot, or an architect, or a lawyer, or a police officer, we have a sense of what those labels mean, right? But when someone says, I'm a Christian, what does that mean? Because sometimes I hear people say things like, I'm a Christian, but not the born again kind, which is a baffling statement to me. But statistics show that nearly 70% of American adults or 176 million adults in America say they're Christians, while only about half of that number claim to be born-again Christians. Now, I know the actual term Christian didn't come until later. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, so you don't have to fact check me on what I'm about to say. But according to Jesus, no one is a Christian without being the born again kind. No one. I'm not judging any, anybody. I, 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 I'm not judging people. And I don't, I don't decide who's going to heaven and who's not. It's just that, once again, according to Jesus... The Christ of Christian, the Christ of Christianity, according to Jesus, all Christians are born again. And anyone who is not born again is not a Christian, no matter how they may self-identify. Now, you may say, well, who are you to say that? I'm nobody. But Jesus said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What would you think if I told you I'm a vegetarian while eating a steak? You'd say, you're not a vegetarian. Vegetarians don't eat meat. But what if I told you, yeah, well, I'm the kind of vegetarian who does eat meat. Would you not argue, but that's not what it means to be a vegetarian, it's not that different to argue for a Christianity that contradicts the teachings of Christ when he said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There is no version of Christianity where being born again is not a fundamental, essential doorway into the kingdom of God. As Jesus told Nicodemus, do not be amazed that I said to you, in other words, why, why would this be surprising to you? Don't let this distract you or divert your attention. Don't, don't, don't be shocked or amazed. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. 
And so let's explore that today. This is the path we're undertaking today. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, meaning that he was a professional theologian. He was was a teacher of the scriptures who knew the Old Testament word for word. He, He knew the entire Old Testament by heart. His whole life was devoted to the study and the teaching of the scriptures. Some say he came to Jesus by night. Did you notice that, that the scripture clarifies that? That he came to Jesus by night because he was afraid or because he was ashamed. But I think he came under the shroud of darkness because he honestly, sincerely, seriously, wanted uninterrupted time with Jesus, away from prying eyes and ears. Nicodemus had a stirring in his soul and he needed answers. And he believed that only Jesus could answer those questions. Since every good Jew eagerly awaited and anticipated God's kingdom, Jesus jumped right in on the front end of this conversation. He said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, a person's race or religion or resume is not enough to gain entry into the kingdom of God. Everyone, even rulers of the Jews, everyone has to be born again. So let's dissect the passage we read into three parts and let each part address a specific question about being born again, beginning with verses four through eight. First, what does it mean? What does it mean to be born again? Nicodemus struggled to understand the concept of being born again. How how can a man who's already old be born again, he asked Jesus. Can he go back into his mother's womb and be born a second time? What does it mean to be born again? When we're trying to understand a spiritual concept through a physical lens, the two don't compute. He's struggling to understand. This phrase translated born again can also be translated as born from above. So think of it this way. When we're born the first time, we're born to earthly parents through physical birth. What Jesus described as being born of water. From a medical standpoint, think of amniotic fluid. Born of water and born of the flesh. But being born from above is, is, is a spiritual rebirth into God's family, what Jesus described as being born of the Spirit, a new beginning that comes directly from God. The Apostle Paul described it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, like this, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. King James says, creation, new creation, the old things passed away, behold, new things have come. The prophet Ezekiel prophesied this kind of spiritual transformation nearly 600 years prior. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart and I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Being born again or born from above is to be changed by God from the inside out. A spiritual change that we have to experience to see the kingdom of God. This is is not negotiable. This is not optional. We have to be born again to see the kingdom of God. But listen, when God changes our hearts, he goes on to change our lives. He changes us from the inside out. Do you remember the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11? Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. Paul is speaking to the church of Corinth. He says, these are labels that once upon a time you wore. These, these labels defined your life. This is who you were. It's not who you are. It's who you were. But God changed you from the inside out. Such were some of you. He changed your heart. And when he changed your heart, he went on to change your life. Such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. To be born again is to be born from above. And that makes us a new person. Last year, our part of town saw two Whataburgers built. One on Madison Street and the other on MLK on 76. In both cases, there were already buildings on the properties. You may remember this. One was an IHOP that... I think, didn't survive COVID. I'm not sure about that. And the other was a bank. Not, why, not sure why that didn't make it. But there were properties already on, I mean, there were buildings on the properties already when the developers purchased these properties. But in both cases, when the developers bought the properties, they demolished the existing buildings to make room to build the restaurants. They weren't interested in making better use of empty buildings. They were building something new from the ground up. And when we're born again, God doesn't set out to make us better. He makes us new. And there is a difference. He builds from the ground up. He changes us from the inside out. Second, how does it happen? Isn't that the question Nicodemus asked in verse 9? How can these things be? The simple answer to that question is Jesus. But let me explain. Better yet, let Jesus explain. Beginning in verse 13, Jesus began to clarify why he came into the world. So that whoever believes will in him, in Jesus, have eternal life. He mentioned an Old Testament event from the book of Numbers about Moses and the bronze serpent. Some of you are already familiar with that story, but if not, in that story, the people of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and many were bitten by poisonous snakes, causing them to become sick and even die. And so the people of Israel cried out to Moses for help. And when Moses interceded for the people, God told him to make a bronze serpent a symbol of the very thing that was causing them pain and death, to make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. Anyone who was bitten and looked at that bronze serpent was healed. It was an act of faith to look at that bronze serpent. Didn't have to make cognitive sense. It was a matter of faith to look at the serpent. And when they did, they were healed. Some did that, but others refused to believe and they died. But Jesus used that example to say, as Moses lifted, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I sometimes hear people point to that verse and they talk about lifting up Jesus in praise and they'll couple that with John 12, 32, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Lift him up, lift him up, lift him up in praise. But that's not what Jesus meant. That's not at all what he was talking about in either of those verses. He's talking about the cross. He came into the world to die upon the cross. And just as the people in the desert were saved by looking at the snake, we're saved by looking to Jesus in faith, believing in him and what he did for us on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. 
How does it happen? By believing in Jesus. Not just believing that he existed once upon a time, but believing in the sense of trusting in him. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. He became a symbol of the very thing that causes our spiritual pain and death. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is the great exchange. By faith, we give him our sins as we repent. And he gives us his righteousness as we believe in the gospel. That is how we are born again. But there's a final question that we simply cannot ignore. What about those who insist they're Christians, but not the born again kind? If the words of Jesus in verses 18 through 21 are to be trusted, and of course they are, then anyone who is not born again is outside the kingdom of God. And to be outside the kingdom of God is to be under his judgment because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. When we are in Christ, he took our judgment. But when we refuse Christ, then we're choosing to come under that judgment ourselves because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the judgment. Look at verse 19, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. This is what happens when people pick and choose what they want to believe from the Bible based on whether it fits what they want to believe. And that almost always comes down to moral choices. Some people say they have intellectual objections to the scriptures, and I won't deny that perhaps that does exist to some extent, but almost always it comes down to moral choices. But being born again, Becoming a new person with sinful ways in the rearview mirror means that we cannot go on living in darkness. He who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So let me repeat something I said earlier. There is no version of Christianity where being born again is not a fundamental, essential doorway into the kingdom of God. And so let me ask you the most important question that I could ask today. Are you born again? Have you come to the place in your life when you recognized yourself as a sinner in need of forgiveness, broken in need of healing, spiritually dead in need of new life, and found what you were looking for in Jesus? Are you born again? There's a great story in Mark chapter 12 about a Jewish scribe. Scribes were experts in the scriptures experts in the law. But Jesus had a, um, an intelligent conversation with this scribe. Jesus was impressed with what he had to say. And, and so Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. In other words, you're so close. I preached a sermon years ago called Close Only Counts in Horseshoes and Hand Grenades. A lot of folk are close to the kingdom, but they're not in the kingdom. Agrippa told Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian, but almost is not enough. And close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. What what, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that understanding the gospel in your head without trusting in the gospel in your heart is being close to the kingdom, but not in the kingdom. Almost a Christian, but not yet a Christian. So 
How do I know whether the gospel is in my head or in my heart? That's a great question. A question that really all of us should ask ourselves. How do I know whether the gospel is in my head or in my heart? I'll say this. Is what you know transforming your life? I speak in present tense because none of us has arrived. None of us are where we should be or will be. And so I'm asking in present tense, not past tense. Is what you know transforming your life? If it is, then the gospel has evidently filled your heart because your heart not the pumping muscle in your chest, but that control center of your life. Your, your heart, out of your heart flow the issues of life. Your heart controls your life. And so if it is transforming your life, then the gospel has evidently filled your heart. But if what you know is not transforming your life, then it has only filled your head. And the distance between heaven and hell is about 12 inches probably less than that. It's the difference between knowing something in your heart and knowing it in your head. If you are not far from the kingdom of God, if, if you're close, but not quite there, let's close that gap today. I want to invite you and encourage you to talk to someone. Pastors will be standing nearby. You'll see a pastor standing down front in just a moment. We have trained encouragers sprinkled in the room right now who would love to go to a quieter place with you and talk more about what it means to be born again. If you're close but not quite there, almost but not in yet, don't miss this opportunity to do business with God. You must be born again. Let that happen today. Or maybe you are far from the kingdom of God. Maybe you'd describe your relationship with God that I am so far, so far away. God doesn't want somebody like me, you might think. Let's at least begin the conversation. Let's at, let's at least begin talking about what it means to be born again. We're not into beating people over the head with a Bible. We're not going to twist your arm, play mind games with you, get you to do something you don't want to do. But at the very least, we'd love to walk through the good news of Jesus with you. So let's at least begin that conversation. Now, there's information on the screen as to how you can respond electronically. And you can shoot us a text, just send us a word. Those words are on the screen. And we'll know what it is you want to talk about, and we'll be in touch with you soon. But you have an opportunity, those of you who are in the room, you have an opportunity to talk to somebody right now. And so I want to ask you to come. As God's Holy Spirit draws your heart to his own, I want to ask you to come. I'm going to pray when I say amen. We're going to sing a song. And during that song, you come. As God leads your heart, you come. Gracious God, in the beautiful, powerful name of Jesus, we praise your holy name. And Lord, we ask for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, in our lives, in our hearts as it is in heaven. And Lord, thank you for speaking so clearly to our hearts. You must be born again. Oh God, thank you for the clarity of your word. Thank you for the conviction of your spirit. Now, Father, I'm simply trusting that you are drawing lost souls unto your heart and, Lord, reminding those of us who are born again that we've been awakened from our, our, our spiritual death, not to continue walking in darkness, but to walk in light, to walk in truth. And so, Father, may we surrender afresh and anew to that reality. Bless these moments to come, Father. For your glory and our good, in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You come as God speaks to your heart today.